So up until now then I've discussed a lot about this progressive path and it's my feeling from the comments that I receive that most people still don't really understand what is meant by the progressive path. There are some basic mistaken assumptions we have about what this means but what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about what the direct path is because I haven't covered that in much detail. I mean there's reasons for not covering that. It's quite a difficult topic and there are certain pitfalls that come along with trying to explain what that involves. If you give people a mistaken idea then it can be quite negative. It can have negative repercussions. So I want to give you a kind of worldly example. Uh, these worldly analogies often uh, aren't comprehensive. There's issues with them but uh, it's the best we can do. So let's say you wanted to study uh, automotive repair. Now this is something that I did when I was in high school so I know a little bit about how it's done and basically we spent a lot of time in the classroom uh, studying theory. So we looked at diagrams and pictures and the teacher explained the process. He explained the different parts of the automobile, how they work and also common faults to be expected. But of course that on its own is not enough. And what you need to do is you need to have some practical experience. So generally at the end of the class then we would go into the workshop and we would actually deal with real engines and starting off with simple things like lawnmower engines etc. And we would try to solve problems based on our newfound knowledge. So this is quite a good analogy for the difference between what we call the progressive path and the direct path. So we can think about the progressive path as primarily uh, learning the theory behind things. It's about theories and ideas and I understand that many Westerners are not very keen on this aspect of spirituality but uh, I suspect that's because they kind of misunderstand the importance of theory. They see it to be some kind of doctrine or dogma uh, but it's not really like that. You need a foundation of understanding for anything you do. For example, if you're going to do automotive repair, you need some foundation of understanding. Now having said that, then from my experience of studying automotive repair in high school for a year, then there were some children who had an advantage and those children were the ones who from a young age had worked with their fathers or potentially with their mothers uh, on fixing cars. I have to say that at that time there were no children who had fixed cars with their mothers. It was only children who had fixed cars with their fathers. Uh, but they had a distinct advantage and they learned practical skills at a young age and so they were much better at it and it was much easier for them uh, to learn the subject. In fact they already had a lot of knowledge. Was it the case that they uh, did it all on their own? No. They relied on their father who had a lot of experience fixing cars and so they kind of watched and imitated. So the direct path is very much like this practical application. Uh, the analogy is a bit difficult when it comes to meditation but we can think about it in that way. Now could one say that there is no advantage in studying the theory? or being taught about how things work. Well I suspect that these children who had some advantage uh, were told by their father uh, the principles of auto mechanics and what the different components were. And a lot of what they learned was from practical hands-on work. And so we can say that this sort of practical hands-on direct working with something is what we call the direct path. Now the problem we have in the West is we've got this kind of assumption that we can get rid of the theory part and just go straight to the main point. So why do you need all this complicated theory? Why do you need to go do sort of yoga asan? Why do you need to do mantras? Why do you need to do study of texts when you can just go straight to the main point? Well this is a kind of naive idea because this main point is something that is essentially hidden from us and it's also very profound and very difficult. Now let's just give another example. So we've got archaeologists. Uh, 
Now, an archaeologist can discover something, let's say. They discover something in a site, and here I'll use as an example, there's this dorje. It's a kind of ritual implement that we use in the Buddha Dharma. Now, they find something like this. Let's say this is something that doesn't exist in texts and in drawings, you know, cave paintings, etc. They find some artifact, and they've got to sort of figure out uh, what it is and what its purpose was. So the first thing they might do is they might look at what it's made of. Like if this is metal, then they'll look at that metal. And then knowing what kind of alloy it is, for example, if it's bronze, then it could only have been produced in the bronze era. Or, you know, after the beginning of the bronze era, not before. Of course, there's some overlap in the dates, etc. But this investigation that they're doing is based on a lot of prior study, right? It's not like they can just pick up an article like this and just look at it and know what it is and what its function is. They have kind of have to rely on their previous studies and their previous knowledge. So the way many uh, modern people think about this progressive path is that it's something uh, that can be abandoned. It's not necessary. So I'm going to quote a few kind of modern non-dual teachers here uh, when I talk about this direct and progressive path. And that's because I think it can be very helpful to compare different ideas. But I have to say that if you are likely to get upset because you think that I'm criticizing your teacher or you think that I'm challenging your worldview, then it's really better if you don't watch this video or any of my videos. They're not for you. Uh, these are only for people who want to kind of question their assumptions and get in a bit deeper. So we've got this one teacher, Adyashanti, and I was listening to one of his talks. And what he suggested was, is that uh, this progressive path isn't really that useful. And I think what he said was it's sort of sometimes, rarely, then the progressive path works. But that you don't really need to engage in the progressive path uh, because your job is to come to know yourself. And you are who you are, so why do you need to study other things, or why do you need to do you know, yoga postures and mantras and all that sort of stuff? Now, I'm just going to uh, look at how he describes the direct path. So he says, to quote him, uh, the direct path is letting go of all definitions and just residing in the I, unconditioned. That is the direct path. So for him, the direct path is a matter of letting go of the way we define things, you know, the basis for their definitions. Now, whether or not that's something that can be easily done is another question. So it is the path where you just stand there and let everything fall away from you. It sounds very simple, right? As if I can just stand there and then all my preconceptions will disappear. But I suggest that it is not that easy to get rid of our preconceptions, just like it's not uh, that simple to understand what this kind of ancient object is without any prior knowledge. We kind of rely on our learning and our education, especially when it comes to something that's quite difficult. For example, if you were uh, presenting somebody with a carburetor, this is part of a motor car, and they were uninitiated. They're somebody who's never studied automotive mechanics. They probably wouldn't even know what it was and certainly wouldn't know the name of it and couldn't fix it. It is possible that they could take it apart, if they're very clever, they could take it apart and come to guess what it was used for and even how it works. Uh, but again, this largely depends on their prior study. If they studied physics, at high school, then they might be able to determine that this is some kind of Venturi uh, type object and it's mixing fuels and air, etc. And then in that process, they'd come to some understanding. So further to discuss um, Adyashanti's view, then he says, strictly speaking, there is no path to it. So there is no path to the direct path. And what do we mean by path? By path, we mean a journey, right? A progression from here to there. And it also involves some kind of mechanical action or effort. So a path is where there is something to do. So I interpret this, I might be wrong, but him saying this, I interpret as saying that there's nothing to do. Strictly speaking, there is no path to it. And then 
Right after that, he goes on to say, if there is any path at all, it is the destruction of every idea you ever had about yourself. Okay, one statement is there's nothing to do, there's no path. And the next one is you need to destroy every idea you have ever had about yourself. Now, is that a simple thing to do? Now, I suggest it isn't. For example, I could take a lot of hallucinogenics, like LSD, and then temporarily I would probably lose all my prior kind of constructs about what the self are, what my identity was. But the problem is, when I sobered up the next day, I would still be left with those assumptions, you know, preconceptions about me. I might be a bit groggy, but certainly after a week, I'd be pretty much back where I was before. Now, I understand that there are people who present this um, a path of psychological healing, which is called microdosing. And I say, I think there's a lot of kind of uh, logic to that, and it probably uh, works in some cases. But the evidence is for and against. There's no definitive evidence that this is kind of a valid path of psychological healing to take small amounts of uh, lysergics or small amounts of hallucinogenics, you know, magic mushrooms, and in that way kind of improve our psychological condition. Might work for some people. But when it comes to this, what uh, Dyashanti is talking about, is a complete destruction of every idea you've ever had about yourself, that's not simple. I mean, you can hit yourself on the head with a hammer, right? And temporarily, you will lose consciousness. So you will lose all your preconceptions. But as soon as you regain consciousness, you're back where you started. And not only that, you probably have some regrets for having hit yourself on the head. Although he's suggesting that there is no path, at the same time, he's giving a path that is not in any way easy to achieve, right? He says, it's just mind examining itself until uh, these conceptual knots are undone. It's all about knots in the mind. Well, this is not a, an easy process, and this is what the progressive path is all about. And the progressive path has many different flavors, and there's a reason for doing yoga asana, for example, because the mind often follows what the body is doing, right? There's a kind of reflection from the mind to the body and the body to the mind. And so by stilling the body, we're able to find some stability and some center for our consciousness or our awareness. And by doing that, we're able to reduce our distraction. And why do we need to reduce our distraction? And that's because as long as we're distracted, we're not going to be able to engage in this profound investigation of what it means to have preconceptions or ideas or definitions about the self. Even if you were to ask somebody, how do you define awareness? They wouldn't be able to give you an easy answer, right? So it's not a simple matter. To me, these are kind of trite statements. They sound good, but they're a little bit naive. They kind of a lot of assumptions about this. Now, as I understand it, then Adyashanti studied in the Zen tradition. And so famously, uh, there's this Banke, and he was the teacher who taught the lazy path to enlightenment, we call realization of the unborn. And so I assume that what Adyashanti is talking about is this unborn, this Buddha nature. In fact, what I've read, and of course I can't be sure, because everything on Wikipedia isn't correct, but I'm assuming that the primary authors of his Wikipedia page are his followers, because it's all kind of positive stuff about him. So in there, it claims that he had enlightened experiences at a young age, and then eventually realized Kensho. So what is the realization of Kensho? Realization of Kensho is realization of Buddha nature. Basically, it's enlightenment. Somebody who has realized their Buddha nature is extremely uh, advanced practitioner. Uh, not only that, they will display kind of miraculous qualities, really. It's not something that um, ordinary beings achieve, and I am absolutely certain that he hasn't achieved Kensho. It's just a common kind of self-deception that Westerners fall into. We are very readily accept that we have some high level of realization, but that high level of realization is only based on, as I said in a recent video, this earlier stage of turning the mind inwards and kind of uh, drawing the sense perceptions into stillness. 
And that feels great. You know, we're really eager to claim that that's some high level of realization, but it's a very low level of the yoga path. And what did this Banke uh, use as his primary method? What did he claim to be the primary method of coming to realize the unborn? Well, it was self-criticism. And that kind of contradicts the statements of the Adyashenti regarding the progressive path. Because what I can gather from what he taught on this short video online on YouTube was that he felt uh, that these progressive teachings on karma cause and effect, for example, were more often than not more harmful than beneficial on the path of self-realization. And why is that? Because uh, you're given this idea that, well, there must be something wrong with me. You know, I have negative experiences, that's because of my karma. So it's kind of this interpretation of karma as blaming the victim, you know, or self-blame. But Banke is saying you need to blame the self. Uh, and he also says that this uh, root of this, the problem is self-desires. So he was much more traditional uh, than Westerners would like to think in his approach. And not only that, uh, then if you look at his own life story, then even once he achieved Kensho, which was affirmed by a Chan master, then he went immediately back into the wilderness and meditated in his hermitage. You know, he didn't take it easy or anything like that. Anyway, I'm not trying to criticize Adyashanti, but from what I can interpret from what I've heard in his own teachings that his kind of level of understanding of the difference between the progressive and the direct path are quite low compared to some other teachers like Rupert Spira and Francis Lucille for example. Now we talk about progressive and direct so we can think about direct as being kind of a practical application but it's more than that it means to go directly uh, to experience and not to deal with these theories and concepts so much. Now, theories and concepts are very, very helpful. For example, if I tell you this story about how you learn to do automotive repair, that's helpful to differentiate between a progressive path and a direct path. There's one that's very practical. You're actually looking at the things that you have to work with and seeing how they work. It's the same in the direct path, uh, then you're kind of looking at appearances to mind and not sort of thinking about concepts. So that brings me to the second teacher, which is Rupert Spiro. Now, in this video, uh, then one of Rupert's students was asking a question about this kind of I am awareness that Rupert is very keen on. And he said, are you aware of the flowers? And the student said immediately, yes. And then Rupert further said, why are you aware of the flowers? Well, uh, she's aware of the flowers based on seeing of the flowers. So that's quite simple. And then he asked, forget about the flowers or these other sensations like bodily sensations. Are you aware? To which she answered, yes. Now Rupert then further probed the student by asking her, how do you know you are aware? And she got stuck. She found it a difficult question. But he insisted that it's not difficult. It's very simple, actually. And his position was that uh, you're aware of the flowers based on perceiving the flowers. You're aware of the sensation in the soles of your feet based on the sensations in your body. And that further, you are aware that you're aware from the experience of awareness. He said, it's not difficult. It is very simple. You don't go to the flowers you go to the experience of being aware. So when you are aware that you are aware, and he suggests that she was very easily or readily able to affirm that she was aware, and that it wasn't based on going to the flowers, but this was based on going to the experience of being aware itself. Now again, to me, this is quite a trite statement, because there's a lot of assumptions wrapped up in that. And not only that, the student herself didn't find it easy. But what Rupert was suggesting is, is that it was easy. In fact, he was telling her it was easy, and he was also telling her the reason why she is aware. Now, this is not something that an authentic Mahamudra teacher would do. They don't really tell their students how it is, and they don't tell their students what to do. Uh, they 
inquire about the student's own experience and work in this way to develop an understanding. And it's very skillful and it's very profound. But what most teachers do is they tell a student how it is. For example, Rupert was asked the other day, uh, where do thoughts come from? And he said, where everything comes from, from consciousness. And he meant this unity consciousness, sometimes called the collective consciousness, sometimes called the collective unconsciousness. I really don't know what the difference is, but it's this idea that there's some kind of Brahmin or there's this pool of consciousness. And so he's telling the student how it is. Now this becomes a suggestion in their meditation. And the problem with this, and the reason why an authentic Mahamudra teacher will not give this kind of instruction to their student is because as soon as you tell a student how it is, then when they sit down in meditation, they will start to try to fabricate an experience in their mind to accommodate this new kind of understanding or this borrowed understanding. It's not something they've come to themselves. So this direct path is very much about coming to personal understanding based on interacting with actual experiences of mind, thoughts, and appearances. When we think about the difference between progressive and direct path, I say progressive path and direct path. Well, there's another thing, and that's called direct insight or wisdom or insight. And we have to differentiate between these because the goal of the progressive path and the goal of the direct path are both the same. The goal is to acquire this wisdom. It's not really like worldly knowledge. It's what we call recognition or what uh, Francis Lucille calls a glimpse of the true essence or the true nature. And this links into what I was teaching the other day. And that's about the differences between method and wisdom. So the progressive path and the direct path are both methods to come to ultimate wisdom. And the progressive path involves looking at ideas and concepts. For example, the concept of I am. So basically everything that's being taught by pretty well, well, all of the uh, teachers I've seen online is this first, it's this progressive path. They try to differentiate between their teachings and the progressive path, but as far as I can see, they are teaching the progressive path. For example, uh, a teacher telling you, oh no, it's not difficult, it's simple. You are aware, you are aware, because of the experience of self-awareness. Now within that, there's a lot of assumption. And that assumption is also not based on the student's direct experience. Do you understand what I'm saying? The direct path is dealing with your personal experience. Now, as far as I can see from looking at the videos of Francis Lucille, he understands this point, whereas none of the other teachers I've heard do understand it. He understands this, he said, well, if I teach you, it doesn't matter if you understand what I'm saying. My teaching you is part of your experience. And at some point in the future, you may refer back to that and then go, oh, that's what he was talking about. Now that to me demonstrates a kind of much more profound understanding of this meaning of the direct path than any of these other teachers have. And I can't really be sure about what Francis Lucille is teaching because I haven't really watched enough of his uh, videos. So I think I will look into more and I would suggest that you look into his teachings because they are kind of very authentic. When I say authentic, I mean that they don't possess these inner contradictions to the extent that they exist, inner contradictions exist within the teachings of most of the spiritual teachers online on YouTube. For example, for Adyashanti to say, well, there's no path, there's nothing to do, but then say you have to destroy all your ideas about who you are. Those are two totally contradictory statements, right? This destruction of all your preconceptions just doesn't happen spontaneously. It's not just gonna fall out of the sky. You can't just sit there. You'll sit there and wait for the rest of your life. And it's not just gonna change anything. A point that Rupert Spira made, which is very correct, he said that from the point of view of the direct path, it is possible for this recognition of our essential nature to take place under any circumstances. Now that is so true, and that shows insight. And it is what is taught in the Mahamudra text as well, that this true nature of mind arises to the perception of ordinary beings uh, under all kinds of conditions, 
and it gives, for example, when you work very, 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 very hard and you complete your task, then for many people there arises this experience of the true nature of mind. The problem is they don't recognize it. And that's the issue here, because this true nature of mind also arises in deep sleep. And this is another point. For example, previously I mentioned Rupert's statement that how are you aware that you are aware, and he said is based on the experience of being aware itself. So without an outer object, and he made this quite clear. He asked the woman, uh, how are you aware you are aware? And she said, I'm aware I'm sitting in this room. And he said, no, 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 no. no. He wanted to make it very clear that it's not based on an outer experience, right? And then he said, you're not, you don't go to the flowers to know that you're aware that you're aware. You go to the experience of awareness itself. So the question is, why are you not aware in deep sleep? And the difference is that in deep sleep, then we do not have uh, objects of the senses arising. We're not aware of sounds and sights and smells and all these sort of things in deep sleep. But we also don't remember this state and we're not aware of being aware. So if there is such a thing as awareness without an external object that one is aware of, uh, then does awareness exist in deep sleep or is it gone? And if it's gone, then it's not this continuous element. So I'm going to go on with this a bit further. Uh, Rupert suggests the direct path. And what is that? What he suggests is that you have these kind of progressive path, which involves years of yogic practices and mantras, etc., until uh, that separate self is sufficiently pure to lead to the dissolution of the separate self into the heart of awareness. So this is his point. That is, when you reach this point where this uh, separate self is dissolved or purified into the heart of awareness, and that's when it becomes the direct path. He says the direct path means going directly to our essential nature. Okay, we can, we can understand that. Uh, the Buddhists also teach that you need to recognize uh, your essential nature, etc. So it sounds all very similar. And so the question is, what is his method? He says, we ask the question, what is it that knows or is aware of my feelings, activities, relationships, etc.? So in that, he's suggesting that there is something other than these appearances, right? Uh, these appearances of feelings, these activities or interrelationships with other people, that there's something aware of that. And then what is the continuous element in my experience? So what he's suggesting is there is this continuous element of experience. So one would have to assume that that does not exist from his position anyway, that that does not exist in deep sleep, because if it did, then there would be awareness. And so, logically, there should be awareness of being aware. As he said to this woman, the reason why you are aware of being aware is because you're aware of the experience of awareness itself. If that exists in deep sleep, then you should be aware in deep sleep. But I would suggest that's not the case, that we're not aware in deep sleep. In fact, the state of deep sleep is one where there isn't awareness or consciousness. But it depends how you define awareness and how you define consciousness, right? You know, the Buddhists, then they define consciousness in terms of the, the outer objects and also the mental awareness, sort of awareness of ideas and concepts. And further, he states that any of these questions, for example, what is the, what is the thing that is aware, feelings, etc., what is the continuous element of experience, uh, any of these questions take the mind directly from the objective content of the experience to the subject, the I. So this process of taking the mind from the objective content to the experience of the subject I is what we call the progressive path. And that's what we're doing when we're sitting in meditation. If you are told to sit and look at a candle, then you are stilling the mind. This is part of this progressive path of drawing the mind uh, towards self-awareness, let's say towards self-awareness, if there is such a thing. Uh, the mind-only school accepts that there is self-awareness. The middle way does not accept this fact, but it's a really deep topic and I won't go into it. So what he's talking about is this process of drawing the mind closer to uh, understanding uh, what is the I, if it exists. Well, the direct path isn't that. The direct path is looking at experience for what it is without these concepts of I, 
these concepts of outer objects, whether they're outer or inner, these are all uh, mental constructs. What we're doing in the direct path is we're looking directly at experience for what it is, without all this other kind of uh, mental garbage. And the problem is, is that this is not easy. The direct path itself is taught to be more difficult than the progressive path. And why I say that most people don't understand the difference is because they think that everything that is difficult, you know, undesirable, is comprised within the progressive path. Doing 100,000 prostrations, doing 100,000 mantras, you know, studying for hours and hours, memorizing text, all that stuff that's difficult and I don't want to do is the progressive path. And the direct path is somehow easy and simple. Uh, Adya Shanti's point is that you are you. So why do you need to look in books, etc.? You know, you need to come to know yourself and you are you. Why not? Well, it's the same. If I have a, an object like this or I have a carburetor or something I've never seen before, well, it is what it is. What else do you need? Well, you need a lot of things if you want to understand what that is. It's not just going to appear to your mind randomly. And the fact is, since beginningless time, we've been habituated towards a kind of misconception and mistaken assumptions. And undoing those things is not easy. It's called habitual tendencies. Now, this is a point where I will come to the teachings of Francis Lucille. And I've included a link in the description below. And he talks in a kind of very lucid way about the differentiation between the progressive and the direct path. And as Rupert Spear was one of his students, then I assume that Rupert is also uh, teaching uh, this same understanding. This is the understanding of the Kashmir tradition. So I see this is a Vedantic uh, Kashmir tradition or Kashmir Shaivism. Now I can see that what Rupert is teaching is based on Francis Lucille's teachings. Uh, his understanding and Francis Lucille's understanding is slightly different. And this is a fundamental point. So Francis Lucille teaches that there is the progressive path. And the progressive path is basically for those who are worldly beings. And this is what I was saying the other day. There are those beings who have never looked into things. They don't, they're not interested in philosophy or metaphysics, and they've never looked into it, and they've had no experiences or glimpses of the true nature. And for them, there is only the progressive path. So what he's saying is these people on the progressive path have never had any glimpse into the true nature. And then he says there's three stages, and that roughly agrees with what Rupert Spirit teaches and also agrees what I'm saying. So I'm saying that the progressive path and the direct path both lead to this direct insight. So this direct insight is the third one. It's not really a path. This final one is what we call the unborn. This final stage is realization. So remember, there's method and wisdom. So it's the ultimate wisdom, final wisdom. Also, we talk about the provisional truth and the ultimate truth, and this is very important. Now, the term we use for provisional truth is leading truth or guiding truth. So this is very much what we're talking about when we say the progressive path. These are terms, conventional ideas that draw us or lead us closer to ultimately understanding or to gaining realization. And that's what we mean by the provisional truth. And the ultimate truth is the actual way things are. It itself is not a principle or a concept, but it is the way things are. And I've heard by many teachers online that they have this idea that you can kind of choose between the provisional truth and the ultimate truth, as if you can study the ultimate truth and then you can choose to make your position from that, you know, from that tenet. But it's not like that. It's not a philosophical position. It is the ontological reality, uh, you know, of everything that exists. It's the true nature of phenomena. And we have no choice. We can only deal with the conventional. As Nagarjuna said, it's without understanding the conventional, then there's no understanding of the ultimate. And without realization of the ultimate, then there is no liberation from samsara. And these are very, very profound words. So anyway, returning back to Francis Lucille's position, there's this progressive path, and that is the path of worldly beings. And then there is this second path, which is what he calls the path of energy. And that is for uh, beings, individuals, who have had a glimpse into the true nature of reality. Now, having had a glimpse into the true nature of reality, they still have thick habitual tendencies. They have 
thick karmic disposition. It's very simple to understand, it's not difficult. If somebody is a heroin addict, and they've been a heroin addict for many years, or I suppose these days, it's not heroin, it's fentanyl, then it's very, very difficult for them to overcome that, right? Because they have such ingrained habits, and not only that, it changes the structure of the brain. So it's very difficult for them to give up on their habit. I mean, even giving up something like smoking is difficult, right? So that's what we're like. And this is kind of a point that I think Adyashanti is missing. Yes, it's true that we have to drop all our preconceptions about self, but dropping those preconceptions are not easy in any way. It takes the progressive path, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, in order to do the job. Well, there's no other way for us to do it. And even if we come close to recognizing the truth, our habitual tendencies are so strong that they were going to override uh, anything that we've realized or understood. So here, what Francis Lucille is saying is there's a second path, and that's people who have had a glimpse. So somebody's had a sort of insight into the true nature of mind, true nature of our being, uh, but they still have all their habitual tendencies. Now, Rupert Spear talks about this point as well in his teaching, but he phrases it slightly differently. He says, this recognition of our essential nature is not, in the direct path, considered to be the end of the journey. There is a further step. So this is similar. There's this recognition or this glimpse that Francis Lucille was talking about. There is a further step, and that is to realign the way we think, feel, act, perceive, and relate with this new recognition. So what he's suggesting is we get a glimpse of the true nature, seeing that, understanding that, then we need to condition our experience to realign uh, with that. Now, the way that Lucille puts it is on this path of energy, the second path, the old habitual patterns come in and temporarily seem to hide the freedom that has been discovered. This freedom that has been discovered is direct insight. This freedom that has been discovered is this wisdom, right? We've seen it, we've glimpsed it, but we have these strong habitual tendencies. And so what happens on this path of energy is that our natural way of feeling, perceiving, relating to our experience, realigns uh, with the true reality that we have seen. Now this is a kind of passive use of the verb. This, this is very prevalent within the Tibetan language. They very intentionally use the active and the passive forms. So there is gom, which is to meditate or to cultivate, and there's gom. And gom is once something has become habituated. So this is a really important understanding, and it demonstrates whether or not somebody has deep insight into this matter. So from uh, Francis Lucille's position, then there's this realignment that occurs over the path of energy. And it's not as Rupert Spira suggests that one must realign the way one thinks and reacts to things in accordance with this. If you see the truth in something, it's you don't need to convince yourself of that truth. It's merely by residing in that, uh, that our natural habitual tendencies are kind of purified. And that's what it's taught in the Buddha Dharma. And so from, to my mind, that this subtle difference indicates that Francis Lucille has a much higher level understanding of this Kashmir tradition's presentation of the direct and the progressive path. So what is the final goal? Well, the final goal is this direct insight or wisdom. So this, this realization is the final goal. And in his teaching, that is the path of Shiva. And what is that? When the belief or the feeling to be separate is absent. There is nothing to do. That's the direct path. This is it. Once our habitual tendencies have been undone, once our uh, predisposition to our assumptions about our identity, who we are, have fallen away, then there is this spontaneous unborn direct path. But I wouldn't call it a path. What it's taught in the Buddha Dharma, it's the path of no more learning. So it's the path where there's nothing left to do. So this is the resultant stage of both of these paths. It's the resultant stage of the progressive path, and it's the resultant stage of the direct path. And in the Kashmir tradition, it's called the path of Shiva. But attaining that is not easy. And this explains why the past masters dedicated themselves with such vigor to their practice. And this is the main point that people uh, misunderstand. 
Yes, it is true, at the stage of realization there is nothing more to do. It's the path of no more learning. The point is, in order to get there, you have to exert yourself. Now, Adyashanti suggests that somebody who has spent 30 years on the progressive path is kind of no more able to realize uh, the unborn self than somebody who is a first-timer who walks in the door. Well, you could say that that's true, but an archaeologist who has developed many skills and has studied a lot is going to be a lot better placed to come to directly understand this, what this is without any help from scriptural reference, etc., you know, from historical documents, than somebody who's a newbie. Now, having said that, then I have to reiterate something I said in a previous video. Those people who are very intellectual and who have studied a lot often have a lot of problems when it comes to this direct path, as it's taught in the Mount Mudra. So remember, I'm not saying direct path as in this final state here, the path of Shiva. I'm talking about the direct path, which is a method to come to realize wisdom. So there's a progressive path, direct path, and then there is unborn wisdom, which is spontaneously arising. And it's similar to what Francis Lewis Seal is saying here. As far as I can see, this is the closest Vedic tradition uh, to what is taught in the Buddha Dharma. And it's also the first person that I've encountered on YouTube who seems to have very good insight uh, into what this is all about. Now, I'm not sure what Francis Lucille's level of meditation is. Uh, I know that Rupert Spira has a very high level of shamatha. I haven't seen any indication that he has insight into the essential point of mind. He could. But he certainly has good Shini and good uh, Shimata, as does Eckhart Tolle. And I don't know about Francis Lucille. But there's a problem because uh, somebody who has a high level of experience and realization doesn't need uh, meditation. And from what he says in his teaching, then I get, a, I get a kind of feeling that he has some kind of quite profound insight. So I suggest if you're interested in this kind of Hindu or Vedic tradition uh, that teaches about the progressive path and the direct path, then you're going to get a lot more useful insight out of Francis Lucille's teachings because his uh, position is kind of very clear and very lucid. And it doesn't possess uh, kind of inner contradictions. And usually when somebody teaches and their teaching doesn't possess these inner contradictions, that's a reflection of their level of realization because it spontaneously comes out. People get into trouble when they haven't really gone very deep and they try to explain a topic and they get kind of muddled up. And I often do this uh, when I'm explaining something. I often don't put it very well. Uh, also, I'm making these videos spontaneously, so it's a bit difficult not planning them. So today I'm trying to like rely on some things that I've seen online. So we've got the progressive and the direct. Right? The progressive works with the theory and the direct path works directly with experiences. So I gave you the analogy of studying automotive repair. We got to look at the books. This is a carburetor. This is a starter motor. This is the battery. This is a fuel tank, etc., etc., etc. And that's very helpful for us then to go into the practical. Somebody, since a young child who has this practical experience, is kind of spontaneous in that. And we do have people like this. And not only that, we have people who have been doing it for lifetime after lifetime. For example, the Karmapas intentionally reincarnating. So they take their spiritual knowledge with them from lifetime and lifetime and they, they kind of progress. Now there's something that I found kind of a bit um, disappointing really, because it seems like Adyashanti is disparaging the idea of past and future lives and also karma cause and effect. I could be wrong, but it, he said quite directly, he said, well, 10 lifetimes is too much for me, you know. I don't even know if there's anything after this lifetime. So it indicates that either he doesn't have a belief in the past and future lives, and also possibly that maybe he thinks he's going to be liberated from samsara and never be reborn. I'm not exactly sure. But he, the way he talks, he has some kind of resentment for the teachings on karma. It's almost as if the teachings on karma are a way of making somebody feel guilty, you know. Uh, on, 
This is really common in the West and it's not a fault of the Dharma. For example, if you tell somebody in the West it's your karma, then they think you're blaming the victim. Let's say I kind of, you know, I break my leg when they say it's your bad karma. And they think, well, you're blaming the victim. You know, it's a really negative thing to blame the victim. Now, somebody who has a good understanding of karma won't feel that. What they feel is acceptance. It's not that I am bad or I've done something wrong. It's that we've had limitless lifetimes and all possible eventual uh, outcomes have been experienced. We've done everything. We've done the worst things you can possibly imagine. And also we've done some pretty good things. But it's like that for everybody. It's not just me. And you can think about this as passing from one life to another, or you can think about that in terms of the implications of quantum uncertainty and multiverses, you know, replicated copies of oneself, etc. They're really not that different. What it is, it's about infinite possibilities and limitlessness. And so that means that somebody who has an understanding of karma doesn't feel like you're blaming them. They become very open-minded and accepting. And it's very different between if you teach let's say a villager from the Himalayan mountains about karma and you teach a Westerner. In general, this is my experience, when I mention karma to most Westerners who aren't spiritual or religious, they see it to be very negative. They think they're being blamed. So if I broke my leg, well, you're saying it's my fault? And they get angry with it. And they get very small-minded about it. It kind of upsets them. If you teach somebody from a village in the high Himalayan mountains about karma, they don't think that at all. They don't take it personal. It doesn't upset them. What they think is, oh, I must do my best to have good conduct and never hurt another sentient being, right? They take it for what it means, is that appearances arise from our actions and the causal resultant link of activity, which is karma, dictates the way the world is. So where there is hatred, there will be more hatred. Where there is love, there will be more love. Our societies are shaped by our interactions. So the point is that we have to be very careful about our actions and we have to always think of others with this light of love and compassion. And if we do that, then everything will turn out fine. And we can see how that is the case. If everybody in the world believed in karma and so they only had love and compassion for each other, what kind of world would we live in? I mean, what it teaches in the, the practices of the Bodhisattva is that if somebody cuts off your head, then you should see them as being your teacher. You know, how kind they are or somebody uh, criticizes or chastises you. Well, this is a real indication of the difference between us, you know, immature Western spiritual practitioners and these sublime beings. If you even suggest that somebody isn't awakened, they get really angry. Or if you say something that contradicts uh, their teacher, they get really angry. But a bodhisattva will treat you like their lama if you criticize them. They will hold you at the top of their head. They have no self-clinging and only concern for others. So there's no basis there for getting upset or becoming small-minded. So I've gone on a lot. It's become a very long video and I'm not sure whether what I'm trying to get across is clear, but there's a problem when we talk about this direct path. I mean, there's a problem in the way it's taught in the West because it sounds to us like, well, you don't need to do all that difficult stuff. You're already Buddha. There's nothing to do. Well, we can accept, again, if we have somebody who is kind of been a drug addict all their lives, they're addicted to fentanyl. He has lots of sort of uh, illegitimate children who he doesn't support. It could be a woman as well, it doesn't have to be a man. And uh, when he needs to get his kicks, then he's got to go out and rob people, etc. You know, all kinds of problems arise. His life is just completely messed up. Now, if you say that somebody on uh, the progressive path has no distinct advantage over this individual. That's a bit crazy, right? That individual has to struggle just to become a good human being, to sort their life out, just to get somewhere to live for that person is difficult, right? And to avoid uh, negativity is almost impossible. So to say, let's say somebody who is brought up in a monastery and has studied the Buddha Dharma in their life and is very venerable and is filled with loving compassion for all sentient beings, is no better positioned to realize the true nature of reality than a fentanyl addict in the streets of Seattle is absolutely nuts. It's crazy, right? So there is stuff to do. 
and to a greater or lesser degree, we have issues and we need to deal with them. You know, it's fine saying that, well, the Zen masters said that there's no path, the, the sort of methodless meditation. You can say that, but look at their life stories, for God's sake. You know, Banke lived all his life as a hermit, like a beggar begging for food in a little hut in the woods. And when he was declared to have reached final enlightenment, he went and disappeared off into the forest again. You know, he didn't sort of just take it easy, get a girlfriend, uh, retire or something like that. You kind of have to put things into perspective. I understand this tendency in the West uh, to feel very defensive. That's because we're quite small-minded. You know, we've been mollycoddled since a young age. You're not allowed to tell a child that they need to improve in case they develop a negative self-image. Well, I suggest that this is part of our problem in the West. We're kind of, you know, treated with kit gloves all the time and wrapped up in cotton wool. And our entire society has become very spoilt and small-minded. But I mean, it happened to the Romans just before their empire collapsed. They had such luxury and they had such advantage, such privilege, that they just couldn't understand what was going on when their entire world collapsed around them. And part of the problem was they became very spoilt. They couldn't live without their luxury. And we've become like that in the West. But things are changing swiftly. And in 100 years, uh, the world will be a very different place. And uh, sorry for challenging you. And I apologize sincerely if you felt that I've criticized your teacher. I don't mean to. My only intention is to kind of encourage further discourse and develop a profounder understanding of the spiritual path, you know, if I'm able to do that. If we look at the ancient world, it was like this, you know, even in the ancient Islamic world, then they had these meeting halls where Christians and Buddhists and Muslims and things like that would get together and they would discuss various philosophical ideas. They weren't killing each other, but now we're not able to. We're so polarized, we can't accept the opinions of others, and we can't tolerate any kind of criticism. Uh, but especially in the Tibetan tradition, then we see this criticism as being so beneficial. It's just a wonderful thing, because it makes your own understanding that much richer and more profound. So don't be small-minded. Take everything with a pinch of salt. Life's not that bad. Actually, we're very privileged. And so we should use our time wisely. And thank you for your undivided attention and see you next time.